Sasquatch for me and research is probably the biggest surprise in my entire life. Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey were my heroes and I studied anthropology in college just for fun. So I, I didn't believe in Bigfoot. Matter of fact, I thought Bigfoot was the jackalope of the Pacific Northwest. And then I watched a TV show, um, not even on my own volition. My roommates had wanted me to watch this show about Bigfoot, and I was laughing, and we came, I came home after work, we'd have some beers. And this happened to be a show that had Jimmy Chilcutt, who is a fingerprint expert. And based on the two casts that he was analyzing, he said that he would stake his 20-year career as a fingerprint expert that there was a non-disclosed bipedal primate in North America, and that shifted my life forever. It really did. I, something about all of my energy, I just stood up. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I instantly ran down to my office. I jumped on my computer, and I started at the beginning, and that would be the Patterson-Gimlin film. I watched that film every night for a year forwards, backwards. I watched people talking about it. I watched what they had to say, but it didn't matter. I had to watch that film and I had to make the decision for myself that it was valid evidence of Sasquatch. And I did. After a year of watching it, two things came up for me. One, Patty has breasts. And two, when she lifts her back foot up, I actually thought that white back foot made it not credible but when I started watching gorillas walk upright and see their white foot come up and the perfect hairline around it, if you watch them, they're almost identical matches. So I realized, and if you look at the footage, uh, what was available in Hollywood that time, at that time that Patterson Gimlin film came out, the best uh, costume and special effects we had were Planet of the Apes. And if you line up Planet of the Apes with Patty, there's, it's irrefutable evidence that that filming is true and valid. And that's really what started everything for me. It's really funny too because once I got into Sasquatch, I really had to evaluate my whole life in the sense that I had to be honest with myself and I had been dismissing that I'd actually had paranormal experiences my whole life. And I think because I'd been so much on the science side of things, the philosophy, I know I loved research and I know I loved to know about ancient civilizations and I would read things about UFOs and I definitely believed in ghosts. However, um, I think I was always afraid to be categorized as an empath or a psychic. Um, but once I got into Sasquatch, that really melted away because I had to admit that I'd had these experiences, paranormal my whole life. And um, even once when I was eight, actually, in the backyard of my house, I was gifted and uh, with something. And even at the time, I didn't dismiss that experience. I remembered that experience, but I never talked about it. Um, and there's been a lot of experiences like that for me in my life. I've, I, I know when a house is haunted. I can pick up on energies. Um, I, uh, I've always been gifted certain insights and knowledges that I don't understand how I know them. So it's not out of the question that I would actually move into researching Sasquatch, um, but it's also very interesting that prior to then, I really did dismiss all of those. I just said, oh, that happened, and I would leave it. I'd never really talk about it again, or maybe it would be good campfire talk, but I never took the ability or the information seriously. And then something with Sasquatch, because when I did go look in the forest uh, for Gigantopithecus, which is a bipedal primate that has lived on this planet before that we do have a biological record for. I really went into this looking for that experience and it didn't take me very long to realize that uh, this was actually more than that experience, that it was paranormal. It took me a while to get with someone to actually want to go in the woods with me to do, to do this research. I really wanted to do the research. I was dedicated from that minute. I mean, from the minute I conceptualize that there was a possibility that this primate actually existed, I wanted to go in the woods right away. However, it took me several years of theoretical research and then really reaching out to people who do the research themselves, who go into the woods looking for them. I had to meet somebody who was willing to take me and I finally did and I, I did go into the woods 
But I will admit, I went into the woods looking for a Gigantopithecus. That's what I thought it was, or a relic hominid, like a, a Neanderthal that we hadn't discovered yet. And if you really think about it logically, uh, when the colonists came to North America, they were not on an anthropological expedition. So if a non-human, uh, bipedal, most likely nocturnal primate lived in these woods, how would we know? We wouldn't know. No one was looking at that. No one would be searching for that kind of evidence. So um, it took me a while to find someone that I could partner up with and actually trust to go into the woods. And then we did. We went way out in Montana. And um, my, first ex my first time in the woods, I had an experience. And I actually believed that that's what was going to happen. Um, one of my gifts is that I have an, an amazing connection with nature and animals and so animals are never afraid of me and somehow anytime I'm in the forest I always have some sort of interaction with an animal that just shows up so why would I think that I wouldn't have this interaction with this primate um, however from the very first beginning <laughs> my first experience I left Montana realizing that something was up and the reason for that is I'd have been having this encounter over a series of days. Something was knocking in the woods. Something was following us around. I would ask it, hey, are you still there? There would be a knock. Um, I would say, tell me, make a noise if you're still there. And then it would make this noise. And that noise, though, would be really loud. And it's the same exact noise if you Google a gorilla, you watch the male gorilla as a silverback when he's ready to leave a territory, when he wants you to go with him, he'll pop his chest. And so I was hearing that noise and I knew exactly what I was hearing, but I never had the visual. Like it was around me, walking around me, but not coming forward. And the very last day that I was there, I, I gifted. I didn't really know to gift, but I did. I, I, was, I was eating apples and um, I decided to go back into the forest. It's, it's a much longer story, but I decided to leave this apple for whatever was following us around. And then it made a noise at me. And I don't know what that was, and it did it twice, and uh, my companion heard it, and uh, again, I really believed I was looking for a Gigantopithecus, um, and so I'm going to kind of just lean, leap over that whole experience to share with you what happened at the end, because this is when I realized it wasn't just an ape or a, prime, a, a normal primate that you would expect, because as we were leaving, all of the sudden, I started to cry. And this is one of the phenomena that happens when people have Sasquatch experiences. It's called an out of context emotional response. And I noticed that I was having it right away. There would be no reason for me to be driving away and all of a sudden really deep, sad crying. And as we pulled away, all of a sudden I turned my head and I realized that I wasn't having that experience alone, that that was a shared experience. I was having a shared, out of context, emotional response to whatever I had been reacting to or res interacting with in the forest. And we drove away and that's when I knew that something was up. <laughs> there are many um, aspects to what you would consider, quote, a Sasquatch experience. Um, one of them is unbelievable fear. When you talk to somebody who's had an experience, most often they're going to tell you they have this fear that is just, they can't even describe it. Another is, is out of context emotions. Um, another is a very bad smell. Um, there are many, there are several phenomena that, it's, that is really what you would classify as a classic Sasquatch experience. Now, some people will say, well, do you think it's because you're empathic that you're having this experience? And I don't think so. I think that from people that I've taken reports from, especially like hunters, um, I think that possibly the Sasquatch themselves are so psychic that once you're in their presence, you can't help but be also. And that's why people have out of context emotions, which is a very normal experience to have when you've had a Sasquatch experience. You, you experience an abnormal fear. Somebody will be walking in the forest and all of a sudden they're afraid and they don't know why. I've had that experience. Um, some people will be, I cried. Um, 
uh, just very different. They sort of know that something is around them. They don't know why they know it. Um, so I do think the experience is, a, is available to everyone. As an empath, I think I'm way more privy to it because I'm already sensitive to everything that's going on around me anyway. So uh, there's a lot of uh, different ideas of what an empath is or what psychic abilities are. I say that I'm an empath because I, I pick up on things. I have knowings and I call them just knowings and I don't know how I know them. I say it's, I, may, I personally make the distinction between being psychic because I think psychics can actually call that to them. They can actually maybe touch you and say, okay, I'm going to give you this reading. That's not how it happens for me. How it happens for me is I'll just be walking in the forest and hear something that other people won't hear. But we'll start to have an experience based on that. Like I'm like, are you sure you didn't hear that? And then I'll start looking or I'll feel something. Um, it's really tough to define what empathic is because I think the abilities are different from e for each person that has these things. So where my empathic abilities arise, where I'm conscious of them, is I experience a thing called motion. I know when something has moved somewhere. Um, I've had experiences uh, with people who are trackers and I've done some just basic tracking with them and they get right away that I'm really good at it because I have a sense of motion and I can't explain it. I really can't. Um, I know when someone walked by. Um, I know when a ghost has been there. It's like it's energetic. It's like right now this energy feels fine. I don't feel anything but if something was here I could go like this and go oh right there and I don't know how I know that. Um, it's like a magnetic pull. Empaths have different things like we feel emotions too. We, I just don't experience if you were to cry I don't just see you crying and feel compassion for that. I actually start to feel like I'm going to cry. Um, that's a part of being empathic. Uh, and like I said, people have different experiences to their talents. I think it's an empath is a mild form of being psychic because I can't tell you what your brother did 16 years ago, but all of a sudden I can walk up and touch a sock and say, oh my God, is this your brother's? And know that. So that's how mine is different. I believe they choose us. Okay. I don't believe we choose them. Okay. I do believe that. Because Anybody could have this experience. Anybody could be out in the forest. They're here, and uh, they don't choose to show themselves to everybody. Um, there are people who have been doing this research. There are scientists, uh, biologists, wildlife ecologists who have actually... So I divide the camps up into Sasquatch research this way. There are believers who research, who are not experiencers. There are non-believers who research and are non-experiencers. And then there are believers who research and are experiencers, all three. And I'm one of those. I'm a believer, I research, and I'm an experiencer. But not all that research this topic actually experience Sasquatch. Yes, they may find physical evidence, like you find for a gorilla, you can find, um, you can find tracks, although they're very few and far between. You can find tree breaks, you can find structures, you can find these things, but um, there are several people I know in the, in the genre who are famous in the genre right now and who have actually never had an experience. They've found evidences of, but once you experience Sasquatch, it's, you, you've experienced something and you, you don't remember it. And I'm stuttering right now because there's some things that I've experienced that I know why people have the experience and never go back in the woods again. I know this firsthand and I've had two ex of those experiences. So, yeah, there are people who do this research who have never had the experience. And I can tell who they are because there are things that you just can't even talk, you can't even really, you don't have words for it. You don't have a mental construct for what you have experienced. And um, that leaves you with a, a different sort of reality with this whole world after you've had that experience. I've had two experiences of what I call the fear experience, and the fear experience is something so frightening that it, it lives inside your body. It never leaves you. This, the moment I start to talk about it, um, my throat starts to tense up. Um, 
I mean, I guess that would be the definition of what a traumatic experience is, but it's still not the same. It's distinct. Like, I've been in a car accident before where, yes, I can remember everything that happened. It moved in slow motion. I know everything, but I don't feel it. When I talk about the Sasquatch experience that was fearful, my throat starts to go in and my, my chest starts to hurt and I get a little short of breath. So it lives with you far beyond the experience. It's different than a traumatic experience and I can't really explain it, um, why it stays with you. But I'll, I'll let you know one of my fear experiences. It ha actually happened with uh, Dr. Bendernagel and Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum uh, and Todd Standing and uh, Todd Standing's um, brother-in-law. We were at a place called Nordeg we had been hiking in this valley not far from the camp and uh, with the intention uh, that there had been some activity in that valley uh, with the intention of going to that area in the daytime where we felt more safe and then of course sitting in our campsite hoping that maybe in the night we would have activity uh, in the evening. Well around nine o'clock in the middle of a new moon it was so black outside. We were eight miles for those of you who have never been out to the site in Nordig, there are several people who have been out there, but you're out in the middle of nowhere. And um, it's, it, I think it was eight miles from a cell signal. We're so far out in the middle of nowhere. Um, anyway, about nine o'clock, we hear this call from this valley. And immediately it stops all of us. We're sitting around the campfire. Dr. Bendernagel and Dr. Meldrum, they perk up and they start doing what ecologists and biologists and anthropologists do. They're naming every creature in the forest that it could possibly be. Todd, to my left, of course, he's a Bigfoot person, so he says right away, that's Sasquatch. That's all oh, that Sasquatch. And I'm like, I don't know, strange call. Have no idea what that was. And then all of a sudden, about... 100 feet from where I'm sitting from the campfire across the little campsite into the tree line we hear a return call it was a lot it wasn't as loud and Todd looked at me and said can you confront now it's the middle of dark woods the middle of night and on a new moon but the reality is as I'm sitting there with five people um, there are guns available. I'm not far from the fire. It's not far from the campsite. I was a little apprehensive, but the reality was is I really wasn't afraid more than I was just like, okay. Knowing in the back of my mind that had it been a bear or a wolf, I had backup right behind me, so whatever. So I walked out to the tree line and I walked probably 10 feet into the tree line and I started talking. I was like, hello? Is somebody there? And this is again, this out of context emotion, out of context reaction. All of a sudden I looked down. Now I, I promise you when I say this, up here was not fearful. It was a little bit on guard, but when I looked down and I saw my knees, they were shaking. And I, I had to start coaching myself. I, start, I looked down at my knees. I'm like, whoa, you're okay. You're fine. Nothing's happened. You're okay. You can do this. And so then I continued to talk. I got over that, continued to talk, and nothing happened. So I was like, okay, you gave it a shot. You're coming back in. So I came back in, and I sat down. And right away when I sat down, I noticed I was exhausted, like exhausted. And Dr. Bendernagel turned and he looked at me and he said, you know, Sonia, he goes, that was pretty brave. Are you okay? And I said, I am, but I'm really oddly tired. I'm just kind of exhausted. So immediately Dr. Meldrum asked Todd for the, uh, the night vision goggles. And he got up and he started scanning the area. And not far from where we were, he said he saw a figure run from that direction where I had just been that would be what he would call what looked like a Sasquatch running away. He saw it with the night vision goggles. Now I'm sitting there and I'm starting to feel it as I'm talking about it. I was just exhausted 
everything just caved. I just had no energy in me and I wasn't afraid. And then I just went to bed and I got in my sleeping bag. And then about two in the morning, I, I wanted to get up to go to the bathroom and it hit. And it was this paralyzing bodily fear. And I'm naturally claustrophobic a bit and I don't really put my head under the covers. And I literally just forgot about having to go to the bathroom. I pulled the sleeping bag up. I crawled in a fetal ball. And I stayed there until sun got up, sun came up. In the morning, Dr. Meldrum and I had a flight out. We had to leave. And I got up and the first thing I noticed is that the tops of my thighs were on fire with lactic acid like I had done about, I don't know, a hundred squats the night before and we we hadn't hiked that much we were we were riding Argos and taking very gentle hikes we had ATVs to get us around to and from spots um, so there was no reason that my legs should feel that way but they did we left um, that night I spent the night uh, with with someone and we had some wine in a hot tub trying to relax me um, and I had this certain sobriety and tiredness that I couldn't explain and even in the hot tub and I'm not really a big alcohol drinker um, I didn't feel it you know you would think you'd feel a couple of glasses of wine in a hot tub I got out of the hot tub and was just sober and tired and I went to bed and then I got back home to California and for two weeks following that I had that same <sighs> shortness of breath couldn't weakness couldn't feel couldn't figure out what's going on I actually went to a doctor I and I was very honest with her about what happened I said you know I need my vitals checked maybe I had a heart attack I don't know what happened I'm not functioning normally I can't walk very far without being short of breath and my legs are on fire and um, she was very honest with me she took my vitals she said you seem fine Sonia but she goes I'll tell you I think what happened is you were scared to the core I think what happened is you were scared to the core so whatever we move away from that and like I said right now I'm having a biochemical biophys a physiological reaction to the story that I'm telling you I'm having the shortness and tightness in my chest as I'm bringing that back to my conscience consciousness so move two years in the future or maybe a year I'll take it a year in the future I'm back in Nordeg I'm with uh, Dr. Susan McDonald from the University of Toronto she is a wildlife ecologist she runs a gorilla site, I'm sorry, a chimpanzee site, an elephant site, and a raccoon site. Um, ongoing research sites. She came out to the forest with us. We showed her the physical evidences, uh, and she said if she didn't know better, she would believe that she was at a gorilla site in Africa, that the bedding down sites, the tracks, the, the stick breaks, the, the minimal types of structures, she said it looked just like a gorilla site. That night, as we were talking, I told her about the experience that I had had and that the weakness that I had had for weeks following, but the oddest thing of all was the burning sensation on the top of my thighs. And when I said that, she became very serious and she goes, that's infrasound. She was at my elephant site. I was charged by a bull elephant and I was hit from infrasound, and for some reason it makes the lactic acid rise in the top of your thighs. She goes, I've experienced that too. So as far as I know, I don't know what in the forest would actually hit you with infrasound, but that's exactly what I was hit with immediately following talking to something that was in the woods, immediately having Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum witness something leaving that area after I spoke to it. That fear still lives in me. That that I I don't understand it but it is what it is and I don't know that that's not an ability that Sasquatch would have would be infrasound and it would be something that higher order primates I'm sorry higher order predators use to stun their prey infrasound is a uh, it's a subsonic uh, ability that other creatures, other beings in nature have, like dolphins use uh, sonar. They can actually blast sonar out of their head. I believe it's tigers, giraffes, um, lions maybe. They have infrasound and what it supposedly does is actually stun their prey. 
Um, it makes them more calm uh, when they're about to prounce. However, I don't understand why giraffes use infrasound, but elephants use it to speak. I mean, uh, there are scientists who figured out they use infrasound. It's very fascinating. Um, she was trying to figure out why elephant herds would all of a sudden stop the whole herd and flap their ears. And she realized they must be hearing something that she wasn't able to hear. And so she put subsonic microphones out and realized that they are talking, elephant herds are talking at great distances using subsonic sound. So infrasound is just a subsonic sound that uh, animals use. However, we can use it right now in cinematography. Um, it's very unsettling. And so I think the, the movie Paranormal Activity was the first to use infrasound in their movie theaters and people were so upset about it they would actually vomit because the sound makes you feel so uneasy. So infrasound is something that's natural. Uh, several species of animals use it. I do believe gorilla is one. I know that giraffes and tigers are and I think there's a handful of others that we do know that use them, uses it. Someone asked me one time why um, I don't take casts. And I'm like, because uh, if calves prove something, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum would have proved it a long time ago. He has thousands of casts. But the real reason is this. In order to make a cast credible, you have to have dermal ridges. That's how you identify something. You can have an outline of something and go, yeah, I know it's a cougar, but unless you have some sort of dermal ridges or you know, an animal, a primate that has dermal ridges, you can't identify it. You cannot make a positive ID. So, um, the cast that uh, Jimmy Chilcutt had had dermal ridges, and that makes all the difference. But no, I'm not going to carry all the stuff to have a cast to be in the substrate that will not produce dermal ridges. That just makes no sense. And if a cast that doesn't produce dermal ridges was bona fide, then like I said, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum has thousands of them. We prove the species. One of the reasons why I asked if you want the whole picture is because the only thing I have as a researcher is my, credi researcher is my, my own word and my credibility. And so sometimes I break these stories up so much, I just don't want anybody to think that I said it one way at one place and another way at another place. Because these stories do, ha they are bigger, they have a greater context. Yeah. And that excursion in Montana, it has so much more to the story than I even shared with you, you know? And so that's why I said, well, do you want to hear it? But I can break down the Toronto one. Plus, Mike and I have already talked on in public. We've done a YouTube video about our experience there. But we basically got displayed on just like, um, so when chimps, when chimps, when all animals do this, all mammals that, that, that protect a territory, they display on one another first before they decide if they actually have to clash. Um, clashes are not really what anybody wants to have happen. And so any species. So animals will get up to each other and they'll huff and they'll puff and they'll break things and then they'll go, okay, well you can go that way, we're gonna go this way. And sometimes it turns into a bloody battle. So I was in the forest uh, with uh, Mike Patterson. We were. Uh, we were on a logging road. Uh, well, not really. It wasn't a logging road. It was like a snowmobile road. So we were in a, we were in a place uh, pretty remote, not far from the Algonquin Park. And um, basically, uh, the people that go there only go there in the summertime. In the winter, nobody really lives there. And if you do stay out there, you have to have a snowmobile to get around. You can't get a car in there. So we were on one of the little snowmobile roads that was going around this like uh, water area, like a creek or a lake or something. and. Um, we were standing looking up at this hill and down the hill came the sound and it just went trash 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 boom it stopped and then trash trash and I look at Mike and he says of course it's a Sasquatch and please understand that anybody that does this they all think everything's Sasquatch and I'm a little bit more um, I wouldn't say disbelieving I need a little, little bit something different anyway um, but it's always proven that it ended up being a Sasquatch. So I won't say I'm right in that, but I'm a little bit skeptical. That's the word I'm looking for. So this thing was trash, 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 boom, trash, trash. Mike says that's a Sasquatch. I look at him, I think, yeah, that could have been a deer. Okay, whatever. The following evening, we're a mile away from that location. We're on a small road. It's three in the morning, only a t slight sliver of the moon just past a new moon beautiful beautiful forest dark dark woods we sit a blanket out on this logging road and now it's level I know that the field is level ahead of us and behind us and I'm squinting looking through 
the forest, just looking for anything to move and really into it. And then all of a sudden, from my left and behind, came out of nowhere, but I will say at least 75 yards away, trash, 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 right behind me, boom, trash, trash. Now here's, it sounds like a very simple thing, but here's where it gets interesting. Whatever came up on us was displaying, what I feel is displaying, and any mammal will display on another mammal when they're new in their territory. It felt like, like a chimp running at you and then running away. The boom was right behind me and it was so large and so loud I could only envision it was as big as a bull if not bigger. It was huge like the earth underneath me moved. Boom! I, it happened so fast that my body did not have time to move forward. My brain could not conceptualize what was coming up from behind me and leaving. My body actually did not even move forward. My body did not shake, nothing. It happened like that and it was over. The scary thing for me was not all of that, which should have been frightening to begin with. Trash, 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 boom, trash. It was the last trash. The last little sound was almost as if I had imagined this little foot touching down to touch one leaf to let me know exactly how far it moved and exactly how fast. Now I was stunned. I was sitting there. Uh, I, I didn't know what had just happened. I had no mental construct for what had happened, what moved up behind us and left away from us. Like I said, moved so fast. My body did not move forward. I had no physical reaction. I didn't have time to. It came and went faster than I could actually cogitate that it was coming and leaving. I sat there for a second and I looked at Mike and Mike said, you know, you're doing pretty well. The reason why he said that is because he's had all kinds of phenomena in his territory. He goes, you're doing really well, son. He goes, most people would be running to the cabin right now. And I just looked at him and said, you, you, you can't outrun that. What made it so very interesting, it took me a day to actually realize and go back to the first thing that I told you right now was the night before. Remember the night before? Trash, 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 boom, trash, trash. Oh, that's a deer. The second night, trash, 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 boom, trash, trash. I'm not a deer, sweetheart. <laughs> I'm not a deer. What moved behind me moved so fast that when I got back home to California, I sat out on a country road with my back to the cars that could do anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 miles per hour, and nothing moved up on me that fast. I could hear it. Nothing. I have no mental construct for what moved up on me that quickly. Some people have asked me about the trash sound. Um, and why I describe it that way was because it was in October and that's the sound of falling leaves. It was touching down, trash, trash, trash. But the boom it was huge. It was huge. It was the, I promise you, I know why some people have these encounters and never go in the forest again. What I was conceiving is, is something's coming up from behind me and it's going to it's going to run over me. That's what I was like, something was just coming at me and then it just stopped. And the boom to me was just something just stopped, like it stomped to let me know that I'm right behind you. But I mean, I, I know I'm making that up from my experience, but that's how I experienced it. Like I, I knew something was coming up from behind me, but I didn't have time to even think about it. 
And that boom, I thought, was just stopping on a dime to actually scare me to, or to let me know that I am right here and I'm this big and I'm this close to you. Like it was, what I called it afterward, the only thing I could say was a bluff charge. Like you're in my territory and this is me and that's you and that's how close I am and this is what I can do. And like I said, of all of it, the scariest thing, honestly, was the last trash because I imagine that it came at least 75 yards from me. That's where the sound, and it came out, mind you, that noise came out of a perfectly silent night. There was no lead up to it. Oh, we're hearing something back there. It was just trash, 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 boom. Trash, trash. 75 yards this way easily, at least 50 that way in a V shape. Boom, boom. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I want to say that Sasquatch. I think it was Sasquatch, of course, because I was told the night before. But, you know, I didn't see it. It just scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> like I say, I know why people don't go back in the forest, and I understand it. Um, but that doesn't mean why. I, I have never stopped going back in the forest, and it's because there are some things that are magical. So one of the things that researchers do is a thing called gifting and it's kind of known in the genre that I gift with crystals and uh, the reason I do that is because a crystal is natural it's interesting looking and if I lose it in the forest it's not like a plastic toy that's never going to decompose and it's actually adding to the trash of the universe in the forest so um, there's logical reasons for me leaving crystals although I've been really chided in the genre oh she leaves crystals it's on purpose and there's a reason for it and it's pretty logical. Anyway, so I left this crystal. It's tiger iron, it's in the shape of a heart. I left it in the crook of a tree um, in a space where, uh, on actually private uh, land, but it could never be developed. It has a, it has a species on that land that doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. So the person who owns it, um, just has fence around it and uh, my house uh, backed up to that property and so there's 200 acres that I could just freely go and hike on and I did. Uh, in the five years that I lived at that property I never saw another human in that space. Only I went out there with my cats to hike. And uh, there was this big oak tree back there and I, I left this in the crook of an oak tree. And I would go back and check on it every now and then, and um, nothing would happen. It would move. Maybe it would move. It would be over the other way. I know I left it this way, and it would be this way. I left it over here. It would be over here. But a raccoon could do that. A squirrel could do it. A raven could be interested and do that, see what it is. So I never paid any attention to it. So I left it there for six weeks, um, and then I brought it home. I thought, hmm, nothing's going to happen. And the next morning I woke up. And this was on my doorstep. This is a naturally occurring rock. I've had a geologist look at it. Um, it's a volcanic nature. She says the rock itself is so old that if you were to break it open, there would be sand on the inside of it. And she said she believed the origin was possibly Mount Rainier, which is very interesting because at the time I lived in California. So this is one of my favorite uh, evidences or gifts, you could say. I keep these with me all the time. <laughs> so I don't think it's a matter of Sasquatch, whether it, why it hasn't been discovered or will it be discovered. I think Sasquatch has already been discovered. It's more uh, the scientific community accepting the evidence that we have, the reports, the historical accounts, um, and actually adding this to the biological record, which seems like they refuse to do. Uh, they're not open to it. Matter of fact, um, Jane Goodall said she's open to the possibility of Sasquatch. And Ian Redman, who sits on Diane Fossey's legacy as a world-renowned uh, primatologist and inherited her site um, and worked with her, very much offers us a very credible um, assertion that we should be looking scientifically for Sasquatch. And he states he doesn't know why we're not doing this. 
there is a ton of evidence for the existence of Sasquatch. Like I said, there is, we do have Gigantopithecus. We have a being that is in the biological record that is a 10 feet tall, upright walking ape. We have thousands of track casts that Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum collects. Uh, we have numerous reports from all kinds of people over many years in the United States, as well as a complete cultural record of all indigenous cultures. There are hundreds of names for Sasquatch. Um, the Salish here in this area call it, or the Salish in BC call it Dejunaqua. The Lakota call it Shayatanka. Uh, and they don't talk about this being as being separate from us. Matter of fact, a lot of them say it's the, our brother in the forest. And a lot of them will actually explain how there's the fox, the bear, and the Sasquatch. It's not different for them. It's really uh, Western uh, culture coming into this area not believing. And I'm on the fence about the fact that they only show themselves to people that they want to show themselves to. I don't think they come for everybody. And I think some witness accounts and reports are happenstance. Um, just kind of one was going this path and a human was here. I think that happens because those people there are a lot of those people who let me spend their lives researching Sasquatch and never have another encounter. So I think they show themselves to who they want to show themselves. And I actually think too, I'm on the fence about this because I don't really know what they are and I don't know what they're capable of. And I don't understand everything about them. And, and no one in this genre does. No one does, no matter what they say, they don't. Uh, but I would lean towards the fact that they actually, their survival depends on us not knowing about them. We bring disease, we bring violence, we bring lack of understanding, we bring lack of compassion, uh, we bring aggression, ego, and they know it, they can feel it. It's not hard. I mean, you can feel that when you're in a bar with people. You know who your egotistical humans are, let alone people who will bring violence to them. So, and then I'm on the fence about can we actually hurt them? I don't think we can hurt them per se, but I do think we can destroy their environment. Duh, we're destroying our own environment, let alone theirs. They do have a biological presence here, and that would bring me to that idea, then what are they, right? Have you guys watched the movie Predator? Have you watched it recently? Someone knew something. Someone knew something. And I don't think Predator was made off Sasquatch, but it is made off of the Sasquatch mythology. And how Predator moves, I've seen that in the forest. And David Polites talks about that. That woman who got that photo, she saw it. I've seen it and I've actually filmed it once. Ron's seen the film. It's so slight, but you actually see pixelation going through the forest. And it was right when I heard something and I, my camera pans, I know I'm hearing something, but I don't know where it is. And I see the pixelation. I think Predator was pretty spot on about some things. So somebody knows something. Somebody knows something. The last time I was in the forest with Todd Standing, I was also in the forest with uh, Dr. Susan McDonald. And, uh, she left early. She had a, uh, an emergency home, and uh, Todd and I decided to stay out for one more night. So we left as well. That night, he swore he <clears throat> um, Actually, we stayed for two days. I, I don't know how. We stayed for a couple days afterwards. We were supposed to stay there for a, a slotted amount of time with Dr. McDonald. She had a family emergency. She had to leave, so we stayed for a couple days after. <clears throat> we were buzzed numerous times by a black helicopter and that helicopter came over our campsite and went like this at this angle and buzzed around us now what's really interesting about that years later oh and todd swore he heard gunshot i can sleep like a log i actually can sleep through gunfire it's happened before um i didn't hear anything i can't dispute what he says but he did say he heard gunfire <clears throat> now it's very interesting about that is years later i found out that the only people that have black helicopters are the United States. And why are they in the Canada and why are they in Nordic? 
years later, when I was showing some, some people the territory where we were camping, I noticed an enormous amount of logging happened after we were there. So what would keep the government or anybody saying that Sasquatch doesn't exist? Well, of course, the obvious go-to is for environmental impact reasons. If you have a large primate in North America in our forest, then you can't log because that is their territory, that is their environment. Um, and if you keep destroying their environment, you will kill an endangered species. And obviously, since we can't find them, they are an endangered and uh, they are an endangered species. So that would be one reason why uh, science is not accepting all of the hard evidences and all of the evidences that we have to date about them. As long as there's been human history, there have been giants in our history. The Gilgamesh. King Gilgamesh had to go into the forest. Well, he did this on his own volition, and the gods were not pleased with him about doing this. He went into the cedar forest, and he killed the, the guardian of the forest, who was a big ogre-like, ape-like creature that lived in the forest. Um, and Gilgamesh got in trouble. He was not supposed to do that. The gods were not happy with him. But the Gilgamesh is one of our oldest, uh, one of humanity's oldest written stories on the planet. Um, the Hindus have uh, their army of ape-like creatures that lived in the forest that Krishna called upon to come out of the forest and help him with war. Uh, in Genesis in the Bible, they pushed the giants back to a little town called Hebron. They didn't want them living there any, anymore with the regular humans. Um, there's the story of the Nephilim, who were uh, these beings that were born out of gods into women, human women's, and they created giants. The Greeks have giants. Every culture, and if you look at Egyptian, if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphs, they have larger than life humans, and they think, oh, they're because they were they were just their pharaohs and so they painted them large but I don't know about that I, I don't I'm really on the fence about the fact that these things were considered to be stories or metaphor by ancient peoples that's a stretch to say that what they wrote on their walls wasn't true it doesn't make a lot of sense that they would do that nevertheless um, what do I think they are I mean I think they're what the the indigenous and Native Americans have called them. They're the master of the forest, and that's been my experience of them. They are paranormal in the sense that uh, a lot of people have this uh, philosophy about them being interdimensional because people see them come in to form and leave. One of my favorite reports of them is how many people will say, I thought I was looking at a rock, and then it got up and walked away. I thought I was looking at a bear. And then it stood up on two legs and walked away. I thought I was looking at a tree, and then it walked away. It's a shapeshifter, obviously, meaning that maybe it doesn't quite shift its shape, but maybe as a human, we don't have a mental construct for what we're seeing, so our brain automatically gives meaning. So at first, we think we're seeing something that we recognize, until we can no longer say that we're seeing something that we recognize. I, uh, all I know is it's a non-human, bipedal primate in the North American forest. I know it's nocturnal. I know it has a language. Uh, this would be reported by Ron Moorhead and the Sierra Sounds. Um, they stayed up at that camp for almost 40 years recording sounds that have been proven to be a language. Uh, lots of people have uh, sorts of words that they say. Mike Patterson from Sasquatch, Ontario, same thing. He's, he has human words he hears from the group that he researches. They move fast. Um, one of the things a researcher told me early on in the game, he asked me to be ready for what I was going to experience because he said, you can't track it. You can't kill it, and it can move so fast you won't see it. And after 13 years of research, every word he said was true. If somehow our government has figured out a way to track them or to kill them, that would be a travesty. But somehow I, I just don't believe it, not based on my experience in uh, the Algonquin 
being run upon like that so fast and have it leave so fast, that was when it really finally settled in with me that that person was right. You can't track it, you can't catch it, and you cannot kill it. So I don't know what they are. All I know is I'm forever intrigued and I believe that someday I'll find out. <laughs> when it comes to Sasquatch and UFOs and paranormal activity, um, they're pretty much inseparable. I think the UFO phenomena, because most people experience lights and they do experience things flying through the forest before they'll have a Sasquatch experience. I really haven't ha personally, I've experienced lights and Recently, I did experience a UFO. All oh, that's very hard for me to acknowledge that, but you know, I had to go with the thing that I saw something flying through the forest that I could not identify. Um, a lot of people say that those phenomena are intertwined, and they are because, in a sense, even though I haven't personally experienced, like, oh, I saw a flying light and then I had a Sasquatch, I, I know people that have had that experience. Um, and, but I have had light experiences, I've had Sasquatch experiences, but where I think the paranormal gets in is that, and I don't really like using that word even because I don't think that it's paranormal. I think that it's quite natural behavior. What I think is paranormal is humanity. <laughs> we are paranormal because we don't connect to nature any longer. Nature is prolific and there are lots of energies and lots of uh, beings out here that are interconnected and having experiences and talking to one another all the time and I mean just to give you an example if you think about an expert tracker um, the tracker knows that the squirrel behind me right now is barking at something he's going to look at where that squirrel is barking to know where the predator is most humans are so disconnected from the forest, they don't even hear the squirrel barking. So the activity that people are experiencing is probably in some essence actually very normal. But humans are so desensitized to our earth and all of the experiences that we have here, of course we think this activity is paranormal and we use that word for it because we're desensitized to all of the things that are going on around us. One night, I was journaling and I actually asked, I asked, why haven't I seen you? Why do you not show yourselves to us? And the answer I got was, we saw you ride Sister Mare and Brother Horse until they died. And then we knew that you are no longer connected to our Mother Earth. So we withdrew our view from you. We can't see them because we're not connected to Earth anymore. I was asked to speak at a conference uh, last October. And one of the things that came up for me was I had just finished Ron Moorhead's uh, book called The Quantum Sasquatch, which was an it was an excellent read. Ron did a wonderful job. And there are a lot of people that talk about this, uh, that Sasquatch are an interdimensional being. I knew for myself if I was going to speak at a conference and I had to address that aspect. I had to address all the aspects that I knew of Sasquatch. I had to address the biological part of it because I knew it was biological being. It is a biological being. I had to address the paranormal experiences because I had those experiences. And now I have to address um, this quantum physics aspect of Sasquatch. So I hunkered down and I spent June, July, August, September doing nothing but geeking out on physics. I mean completely geeking out on physics. I watched them all. I watched Brian Greene. I watched all of the conferences. I watched programs on quantum physics. I listened to lectures um, about Einstein and how he became his theory and what it happened was is that if we're going to say the word dimension, then we have to define that word. And why I chose to define that word was because we use the word dimension, but I don't think we know what we're talking about. Meaning, what is a dimension? If you're saying, if someone says to you, well, something leaves the fourth dimension and comes into the third dimension, well, what does that mean? 
What does that look like? How could it possibly be that something, there's this, out, this thing out there called the fifth dimension and we just pop into it. How could that be? And I had to define dimension. And so what I discovered, what I discovered was, is that we actually do not have a working definition of the fourth dimension, meaning we have no physical evidence of the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh dimension. Einstein proved mathematically that eleven dimensions exist. But the reality is, no matter what all of these people say, we have no evidence, we have no physical evidence of a fourth dimension. We only have physical evidence of a first, a second, and a third. And we live in the third. Human's body is a biological apparatus. Matter of fact, everything that you see, every biological entity is nothing more than a biological apparatus created or made or existing in such a way that it is receiving information that supports its survival period. Humans are third dimensions. Our eyes are forward. We see in three dimensions. We are here to experience a thing called the third dimension. Now, I know people talk about time and space being a dimension. It's, I could be wrong, but I'll tell you right now that's not true because every dimension has to have time and its space to exist. So time and space happens to be the container on which dimension can exist. If the first dimension is this plane and the second dimension comes up this way and the third dimension gives volume, all of these things have to have an expression in time and in space. So time and space is the context in which dimension can rise up. The first dimension I'll liken it for an example to an amoeba. An amoeba is a one-celled creature. I actually don't know what amoeba can perceive. I don't know how it has eyes. I'm saying this just for an example. It can only perceive the first dimension. It only is a one-dimensional creature. A snake, for example, is a, a two-dimensional creature. By the fact that it has eyes, even though its eyes are on the sides of its head, it actually only ever experiences hot and cold. That is the nature of its experience reality. It only, if you have a pet snake and it turns around and looks at you as much as you love it and you can feel that love, you can feel that expression, it likes you, it still can never look and see the soft curves of your face. It can't, it can't see any of this. It can't see your hair. It is forever entrapped in a two-dimensional, is this hot or is this cold experience. Humans have three dimensions. I can see that the tree has volume. I can see that the tree has height and I can see that there's space behind me. I live in a third dimensional thing. Einstein proved that all four dimensions are happening at the very same time. So if we're going to say interdimensional, what does that mean? What do you mean that something is coming into our dimension? Well, wouldn't it be like me going into a snake's dimension or into an amoeba? So if you imagine an amoeba in that creek right now, and I put my foot in the creek, what as a one-dimensional being does the amoeba experience of that portion of my foot? So when I started to look at the physics, especially quantum physics, about how this could be possible, it just occurred to me that dimension is happening all at the same time. So even though we're only perceiving the fourth dimension, I cannot, it's not physically possible, biologically possible for me to perceive the fourth dimension, but it's happening right now all around me. Just like if the snake is below me and the amoeba is over here, the third dimension is happening all around them, but they only perceive hot or cold and the one dimension that the amoeba perceives. So I think that Sasquatch is a fourth dimensional being, meaning that somehow we can see part of it as it enters our creek, like the amoeba I just explained, it experienced some part of it, but then it's gone and we don't know where it went and we don't know how it got there. But it has a, it has a need to be here, meaning it comes here for berries, um, it comes here for certain types of food sources, but somehow once it's got that, it seems to be able to move away from us like if I was 
on a boat in the ocean and I dive in and I go down and I look at these fish and I'm so excited about it and I have my little water camera and I take pictures and I swim and I go away and the boat takes off. What does the fish think? Where did I go? And that would explain, it really would explain the speed, velocity, and the actual disappearing, right? The Sasquatch just comes in. I don't know where it came in from because it doesn't live in this experience normally all the time, but it can actually enter the third dimension in, in ecology. It can enter the third dimension in environment. Um, it doesn't have to like open a portal per se. I'm not saying that portals aren't real. I'm not disputing any of that. I'm saying that it just moves in and out of our experience like I just moved in and out of the ocean and left. And it happens that fast. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it went. I know I'm just a fish down here, but where that? what is that human thing? And sometimes the fish will get curious and it'll follow the human. Like, where, where, what are you? And then it sees a boat and then it's gone. And that whole experience leaves you bewildered, especially if you're a human who, first of all, we don't have a mental construct for these kinds of beings because we're not taught this. We're not in school saying, okay, well, there could be an interdimensional being, you know, or a larger dimensional being coming into your existence or coming into your experience and you won't know what that is, so we're not open to it. We're only told all the time what exists and what does not exist all the time that is drilled into us. So our belief system is such a way that if something comes in to our context and leaves, then we don't have we don't have a mental construct for it. A lot of people cannot handle that psychologically, mentally, or emotionally because it challenges everything that they've been taught. And the belief system of the human is actually very, very rock solid if a human only wants to believe one sliver of reality. Um, and that goes back to this idea of being an empath. When I, I said earlier about being an empath, well, my sliver is a lot more open because I'm experiencing things that I don't have a mental construct for often. So I'm okay with that. So when new information comes to me, I'm more open to it. But the more we shut down our belief system, the less we're able to perceive. And isn't it funny if you think about the fairy tales that we're told, Santa Claus will only come if you believe. Fairies only show themselves if you believe. Miracles only happen if you believe. So our belief system, if the construct of our belief system is so strong that we're not believing in other things outside of our normal, our normal areas or arenas that we've been taught, then yeah, we're not going to actually have a Sasquatch experience. And if we do, we're going to be shaken pretty badly by it and never want to talk about it and, and shut it out. Whereas some people who are more open to that experience, like I am, like I look at the world and I'm like, you can have all the scientists, doctors, and physicists in the world tell me everything that's going on. But the truth is, when you look at it, you're still going, what's going on? Like, what is this? Where am I? Look at this thing that we are on called Earth. It feeds every living creature on this planet except humans because humans are greedy look how it is just magnificently self-sufficient everything works the only thing that doesn't work is human and human is the only thing that has this belief system that would tell it something different so what i believe sasquatch is is probably one of many things that are happening around us all the time, that we have no mental construct for, we have a shut off belief system for, and there are certain things that we'll never be able to perceive because if something is exists in the 10th dimension, which is so far removed from us, it would probably come into our experience as a triangle and then leave. And then you have to think about UFOs. Well, how do they come in? Oh my goodness, it just came in as a triangle and then it left. So another thing that I discovered this summer, geeking out on physics, and this is something you'll learn when you're watching people who are, um, who are the physicists. There's a gentleman out there. I don't know his name. I'm sorry, but he's studying uh, the Gorman Ranch, um, also known as the Skinwalker Ranch. There's a lot of paranormal activity that goes on there. And so, um, and, and David Polites has uh, brought this up too as well, is that when you have a, a one of those like 
measuring devices that measures electromagnetic energy. You find that these paranormal sites have a shift or a difference in the electromagnetic energy. What's really interesting about different levels of electromagnetic energy is that the laws of physics as we know them every day, if we were to if we were to operate under the laws of physics right here with no electromagnetic activity, then the laws of physics hold up. But if you change the level of electromagnetic energy, the laws of physics themselves change. Now, David Pilates in his research really states this one question that he couldn't understand why paranormal activity or UFO activity and disappearances all increased around 1947. And I had to think about that for a while. Well, why did that happen? And then all of a sudden I really thought about it. I go, that's interesting. If we change the level of electromagnetic energy, then the laws of physics change. Well, what happens is the laws of physics change. Well, if the laws of physics change, then maybe dimensionality starts to waver. Maybe the layers and the texture of our reality starts to move a bit. Maybe portals do open then, right? Maybe another part of our reality starts to become open to us because remember, the laws of physics are changing when the electromagnetic energy is high or it's also changing. So David Palaiti says, well, I don't know. Why did disappearances start happening around 1947? And, and UFOologists are like, why did UFOs start to happen about 1947? Well, I just decided, well, what happened in 1947? Because what did happen? Like, what was going on then? Well, I immediately went right back to, well, it was 1945 when we first detonated the, uh, an atomic bomb in the United States. And matter of fact, if you actually do a map of where Roswell is and where the first atomic bomb was detonated, they're 20 minutes apart. So we dropped an atomic bomb that radically changed the laws of physics. It radically altered the levels of electromagnetic radiation. Now move forward to where we are now. Someone had asked me, like, why why do you think the paranormal activity seems to be more widespread and more UFOs and more this? Well, all of these devices that we're using, they all operate off of electromagnetic energy of some sort, of a radiation of some sort. So we're constantly changing the laws of physics. Not to mention that the Earth right now is completely enwrapped in satellite technology that is shooting microwave technology back at the Earth. And so we have, we don't really know. And this is one of the frailties of mankind is that mankind and science seems to think that it's okay to invade any environment. Like we think if we can get to the moon, then we should go. And we think if we can get to Mars, then we should go. And we think if we should dive to that deepest part of the ocean, then we should go. But we actually don't ever estimate the subtle layers of the fabric of all things that are all connected when we do these things. So we dropped that bomb and two years later what happened? Roswell happened. Everybody has a phone now. What's happening? People are disappearing like that. Ask David Pilates. People are disappearing and we don't know where they are. We have all of this electromagnetic energy. Matter of fact, 5G, I don't know what 5G is about. I don't know if it's good or bad for us, but the one thing I have been told is 5G is a frequency that does not exist in nature. 5G is a man-made frequency. Now you take the subtle layers of all existence and we're shooting out all of these layers of a frequency that actually doesn't exist in nature. Have we actually done the research to find out what that does to electromagnetic activity and what that does to the nature of reality. No, we haven't. We never do these things. We dropped a bomb and didn't care about what it does to the electromagnetic energy on the planet. That bomb and actually that triangle is also where the Gorman Ranch is, right? The Gorman Ranch happens to be in an area where people have said they've noticed things like happening, like the sky opens up and things shoot in it, into this realm. Well, that is all the triangle. It's a huge, massive triangle where 
we have done nuclear testing. We dropped, I don't know, how many bombs did we drop? How many times did we upset the natural balance, the natural flow of electromagnetic energy, which changed and altered the laws of physics? Our phones do it. One of the things I also learned this summer from a physicist is, and, it, and it's not even that hard to think about, we just don't think about it. The second law of thermodynamics states that nothing is ever created and nothing is ever destroyed. This means that when you delete a photograph off of your cell phone, energy has been expended. Now, it may be at point zero 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 two five amounts of energy, whatever that means. You put a billion phones on the planet, and at one time, they all delete a photo. How much energy is being expended, and what is that doing to the subtle fibers? And here's where it gets even more interesting. Last year, here in the state of Washington, actually was part of this, there was one of the frailties about modern physics, uh, Newtonian physics, I take that back about Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics postulated, well, it really wasn't even Newtonian physics. It was the church. The church mandated that space was empty. And Newtonian physicists and scientists just bought that precept. We bought it as foundational. Space is empty. There's this ball up in the sky, it's called the sun. And there's this ball up in the sky, it's called the moon. And anything in between it is empty. but that's not true and it gets even better it's so not true that we understand now that gravity right is a thing meaning there are such a things as such a thing as gravitational waves so there was a neutrino that exploded somehow in the state of Washington and some other state we created this device that they knew that if gravity if space was empty they knew that if space was empty, then we would not feel the after effect of that explosion many millions of miles away from us. But what happened was, is they got the measuring, they made it, they were able to do this, and somehow they were able to tell that a wave happened. They could feel the explosion. They could measure the explosion, which means that absolutely, without a doubt, space is not empty. There are not two balls sitting up there. That there is something there. There is a subtle layer. There's a subtle fiber. Our atmosphere is a subtle layer, a subtle fiber. I know there's distance between me and you and the camera right now, but the truth is that there's something here. We don't see it. We don't perceive it. But my phone is sending a message to you or somehow to a tower, and it's creating, if you just put a picture in your mind, all of these lines. Well, these lines are radioactive energies and these energies are tearing apart the subtle fibers of our reality. So yeah, these paranormal experiences are going to happen a lot more because we are actually, it's like living in the bottom of the ocean and you don't know that every line that you keep tearing up is actually creating a schism and we're creating them all the time and nuclear bombs was the first one. So that's what happened, Dave Pilates. That's what happened. You want to know why disappearances happened and UFOs happened around 1947? Because it took about two years to actually start working that hole that was created in this biosphere that we're not experiencing because all of the laws of electro, all of the laws of physics are changed when you change the level of electro, electromagnetic and energy. So yeah, this is going to continue happening. Matter of fact, we keep saying we don't understand, scientists keep saying we don't understand why the earth is heating up more. Well, duh. How many satellites do we have right now sending this energy to the earth and we send it back up and that energy is hot. Talk on your phone for 20 minutes and tell me that your phone doesn't heat up. Paranormal activity will start happening more and more. People have been missing more and more on the David Pilates missing 411. I really feel that it has very much to do with the fact that we are tearing the subtle fibers of reality with our energies, not ever considering the fact that we have entered into an environment in which we know nothing about. So that's why I think we're going to have a lot more paranormal experiences. That's why we're going to see more UFOs. And that's why the government has no choice to disclose UFOs because they can't t keep people from talking about it because too many people are experiencing it.